If I were to ask you a question, Juan, Matt, I'm asking you a question. Do you have a true friend? How would you answer it? I'm asking all of you now, do you have a true friend? Just think about it for a moment. Start with the, with the definition of what's a true friend and then ask yourself, do I indeed have a true friend? Now we all have a true friend in, his name starts with J and ends with S, let's say it, Jesus. Jesus. But do we have a friend other than him on this earth? When we have concluded our sermon today, you will be able to answer that question. And I hope that you can say, I indeed have a bedfellow. You say, what in the world is a bedfellow? We will define it. I'm not talking about a sexual partner who goes to bed with you. I'm talking about a bedfellow as defined by Noah Webster and the word of God. So, last week, Steve Childs addressed the first nine verses of Genesis chapter 11 with a very interesting and brilliant look at the Tower of Babel. The message was in actuality a look at the nature of man, which, by the way, hasn't changed for 6,000 years. Man has been man from the day God placed him on this planet we call Earth. And the bottom line is this, that man wants to be God. Call the shots, so to speak. Be number one with a capital. All right, let's try that again. Be number one with a capital. That's what man wants to be. He wanted to be that in the garden. That's why they fell for the lie of Satan. Hey, listen. If you eat of this tree, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Same lie that Satan has spread from day one. Mankind is not the only being in creation that wanted to be God. Or more accurately, wanted what belonged to God. And what is it that God has that no one else will ever have? Two words they both begin with a P. He has position and power. That's what we want as human beings. What do we want? Position. We want power. So Lucifer thought, look at what God has. Look at this power. Look at this position. That's what I want. And he went for it. And he wasn't alone. He had company. Quite a bit he had company. But can I say to you that when you wage war against God, you will never, ever win. I was thinking just as I was preparing this sermon, what is the definition of stupid? Seriously, what's it? Now, don't look at your husband or wife or somebody you don't like. <laughs> it's doing the same thing over and over again, that's what somebody's going to tell you, right? And expecting different results. That's stupid. You know, here I am doing the same thing, and how come I don't get a different result? Well, maybe you need to change how you do it. But may I give you another definition of stupid? It's actually a great witnessing tool. When somebody says to you, what is the definition of stupid? Try giving them this definition instead. Look, here it is. It's Lucifer... And anyone else who thinks they can take on God and win. So if God says to you, some person says to you, what's the definition of stupid? Just say, it's like Lucifer, who thinks that they can take on God and win. Now look at that opportunity that's just been afforded you when you give them a different definition than what they typically hear, correct? So I thought that I would break it down. I mean, that's the quintessence of stupidity. All the angels who followed Lucifer. But we do the same thing. Let me see if I can simplify it. We take on God thinking we can win. Here's how we do it. We skip our quiet time. Think we can handle the day. 
Do we really believe that we can handle a day without Jesus? That we can enter the day and in our own strength and in our own wisdom and in our own intellect, we can take on Satan. How stupid is that? Say that with me. How stupid is that? Now look in the mirror and say, how stupid am I? And sometimes that's what we are. We think we can take on God. When? We don't need our quiet time today. We, we think we can cheat God of the tithe. We'll give him 5% instead of 10% and expect the blessings to come. We think we can mess with someone who doesn't belong to us. Dabble with things that lead to addiction. Bend the rules on life or marriage and how we treat others. Make church a secondary priority. Hang out at parties doing and messing with what we shouldn't be doing and messing with. Thank you for that solo amen. We think we can, we can bend the rules on sex outside of marriage only to say, darn, how did I get bit? And may I say to you as a Christian, more times than not, you're going to say, I can't believe this. I mean, I was obeying God, and all I did was blow it once, and look what happened to me. She's pregnant. That guy's been having sex with her for eight years. He never got, they never got pregnant. You're following me, aren't you? Why is that? Because God's rules are a little different when it comes to his children. They aren't quite as forgiving because we know what we're supposed to do. And we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us that gives us the strength to do it. So when, that, when you get caught, it's like God saying, yeah, I'm your true friend. You're saying with friends like you, I don't need any. I'm only kidding. <laughs> You're following me. When we think we can take on God, we lose. So let, I'm going to say the first part. You're going to finish it for me. When we think we can take on God, we lose. you lose, I lose, society loses. As they say in Montana. And that's in essence what Steve's message was about last week. You know, a few little intellectual think, thoughts and stats. But what was it? It was mankind thinking that he could take on God. I'll build this tower. I'll go to the heavens. I'll be where God is. I'll be God. And God came down and said, no, you won't. And in an instant time, they were all over the place trying to understand one another because nobody knew each other's language. And that brings us to today. The lineage of Shem to Abram. So Lord Jesus, as we look and continue to look into your word, particularly as we begin to sit at table with you and break bread and drink from the cup and then offer our thanksgiving and gratitude for what you've done for us, may you open our eyes as you open the eyes of Cleopas and his friend to see you as never before. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So immediately following the account of the Tower of Babel. The uh, Genesis writer moves us into the lineage of the family of Shem, who just happens to be Noah's oldest son. Now, the begats of the Bible often give us insight into things that we would never otherwise have. But what, let's be honest, what happens when we get to the begats in the Bible? So-and-so begat this person, who begat that person. You're going, are you serious? Am I going to read two and a half pages of these begats? Forget it. You know, and you just jump over to what happens next. May I say, there's not a thing in the Bible that's not without purpose and meaning. There's a reason why God puts the begats, the begets, into the word of God. And he'll often introduce somebody in these begats that like, where did that come from? That's weird. Like really, you look at the genealogy of Christ, there's only five women in the whole genealogy. And you say, why does he introduce those women? So there is something God wants us to learn in the begats. 
So let's go there. Chapter 11. You're all excited. I can tell. You're clicking your heels. Yay, pastor. We're doing big cats. <laughs> Chapter 11. When Nahor had lived 29 years. Now, so if you don't skip over them and you have a little fun, that's what I do. This is the youngest father in the Bible at this point. He's giving birth. Well, he's not. <laughs> but you know what I mean. <laughs> His wife is giving birth when he's 29 years of age. The youngest father to date. And he became the father of Terah, or Terah. And after Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, in Haran. So he's like twice as old, but he gives birth to Abram, Nahor, and Haran, the brothers of Abram, who Nahor and Haran, who is Abraham later in the text. So now we have this genealogy. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father. I don't know if it's Terah or Terah. Jason, how do you say it? What's that? Terah. It's too difficult to pronounce. Terah became the father of Abram. If you want to know how to understand something, just ask Jason. He's a linguistical genius. He really is. That's about the only thing my nephew's a genius. I'm only kidding. I'm having a little fun. So just have a little fun with you, making sure you're with me. Come on, let's go on. So this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the fam of the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. Lot. Why in the world does Lot appear in here? Is he going to be a part of the lineage of Christ? So here's what happens. Over and over again, the Lord will introduce to us somebody that he's, he's, that's going to show up in the narrative a little later. So he, he does that purposely, puts this name in there because he doesn't want to blindside us. He doesn't want to like go, wow, where'd that person come from? So I'm going to give you some examples. We're introduced to Canaan before he's cursed by his grandfather Noah in that not without calls, Genesis 9.18. So we meet Canaan, who is the grandson, kind of out of chronological order. Why? Because something unique is going to take place all around Canaan. So the Bible gives us his name. We're introduced to Lot before the tragic story of his life unfolds. Genesis eleven twenty seven. We are introduced to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, before she's raped by Shechem. We're introduced to Dinah. The next chapter, we have the whole story of her rape. Now, that's insignificant, not in the fact that she's raped, but in the fact that how Jacob and his sons responded, how Simeon and Levi took vengeance into their own hands, went into the town and said, oh, yeah, you can marry our sister, no problem there. Just have all of your men circumcised. So whether the man was 90 years of age or nine or nine months or whatever, every male circumcised. And when they were sore and couldn't protect themselves, Simeon and Levi went in with a sword and slew every man in the city. And Jacob says, you have made me a stench in the name, in, in the nostrils of my neighbors. And they had to move. And then when Jacob gives the blessing, he curses Simeon and Levi, and he tells them they'll never have any property. What I'm saying to you is there's a reason why God introduces these people to us. Just like we're introduced to Tamar, David's daughter, before she's raped by her father's half-brother, Amnon. 2 Samuel chapter 13. Now think about this. Did Jacob have more than one, one daughter? Then don't you think Jacob had more than just Dinah? And didn't David have more than just one daughter, Tamar? But there's only one daughter named in all of the Bible. If he had 19 sons by 10 wives, and that doesn't include all of the sons and daughters he had by concubines, David certainly had more than one daughter. But the Bible only gives us one because there's a narrative built around them. 
But my point is this, that God is telling you ahead of time before it happens. Why? Because he's your friend. I want you to see it. He is a bedfellow to every person who is his son or daughter. And he's not going to blindside us with anything. He's going to tell us ahead of time. How many times has he warned me in my life? How many times has he warned you in your life? What does he say to you? Don't do this because if you do, this is going to be the consequence. And we just think because it doesn't happen, we're just going to keep trucking, baby. I ain't worried about it. You know, and all of a sudden you feel a little boot in your butt. And you go, what's that? Oh, it's God. He'll, he, he'll let me go. He loves me. And then pretty soon it catches up to us. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. One of the largest books in the Bible. It's one of the prophetic books in the Old Testament. And listen to what God says to us. He says, I am the Lord. Finish it. I will not give my glory to anyone else. Finish it. Everything I prophesied has come true. Finish it. And what does he tell us? Come on, read it with me. I will tell you the future before it happens. Now, let's fast forward to John chapter 14. Look at the words of Jesus. He says this. I am leaving you with a gift. What is that gift? Read it with me. Peace of mind and heart. Now why is he telling him that? Because he's going to leave. And they're going to be all alone. And he doesn't want them to feel abandoned. So he says, listen, I'm going to give you peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give is a gift that the world can't give you. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you, that I am going away, but I will come back to you again. So he's telling them ahead of time, here's what's going to happen. I don't want you to be blindsided. I don't want you to be shortchanged. Listen, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to send to the Father, and when I send to the Father, you're going to feel like you're alone, and you are going to be for just a little while. But have peace of mind and have peace of heart because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit is going to come and that Holy Spirit will be me present inside of you. Now I've told you these things before they happen so that when they do happen, you will believe. So that when these happen, you say, oh yeah, that's what Jesus said was going to happen. What's he doing? He's building a trust between you and him. He is your friend. Say that with me. Personalize it. Jesus is my friend. Now Jesus, in the next chapter, goes on. Gives a little more amplification. He says this. No longer do I call you servants. Or as some translations use the word slaves. For the servant or the slave does not know what his master is doing. Listen. If you're my servant, I don't have to explain to you why I'm asking you what I'm asking you to do. And that's what he's saying. You know what? If you're employed by a company and the guy says, hey, your boss says, this is what I want you to do. You, you don't say, well, why do you want me to do that? I don't think that's the way we ought to do it. Because if you say that more than one or two times, you're not going to have a job the next day. You know, if the boss says, do it, you do it. And he's saying, you know, that's the way you were. You were my servant. I say, do this, do that. You did this, you did that. But he says, no longer, because I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Listen to me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. You didn't say, hey, I want to be your friend, Jesus. Jesus said, you know what, Ron? I want to be your friend. And so he chooses us. And he goes on and he says, but I chose you and appointed you for a reason. Read the reason with me. That you should go, come on, bear fruit and that my fruit should abide, that is, remain, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. 
these things I command you so that you may love one another. How can you love one another if you don't believe in one another? How can you love one another if you don't trust one another? So he's saying, you can trust me. I've told you this is what's going to happen if it happens. And I'm telling you that you can go and bear fruit and that fruit will remain. How many people say all the time, Pastor, I don't know what my purpose is. We raise our hands and we say, I was born with value and purpose. What's that? Promise and potential. I don't see any. I hear my dad saying, you ain't worth. You won't mount to anything. But we know that's not what God tells us. Because he gives us our purpose. Look at verse 16. But I chose you and I appointed you. So let's do this. Say, but I chose, and put your name in. But I chose Bruce. I only heard two people, Bruce and Bruce. So let's try that again, shall we? But I chose Bruce. Now, you don't say Bruce. I say Bruce. <laughs> you say Daryl. All right, you ready? But I chose and appointed that should go and bear fruit and that should abide. <laughs> you got it. So what I'm saying to you is he chose you because he has a job for you to do. And when you do it, he expects it to last. Now grasp this, every time we walk in obedience, our purpose unfolds. Whether it be large or small, seemingly significant or insignificant, let's say this last line together, nothing is insignificant when it's in God's will. And the church said, Amen. so let me unfold this story. So Abram is 75 years of age when God calls him, when God chooses him. So see, some of you people who are thinking you're getting up in your years and God can't use you, Abram was 75. Now I just want to warn you ahead of time, he lived till he was 175. So if you want to live that long, say, God, you can choose me. That was supposed to be funny. Anyway. So God, God chooses Abram, and he tells him to just go to a land where God wants him to go. And he says to him, I want you to leave your father and your family and go by yourself. And he doesn't do it. He leaves, but he takes his whole family with him, his dad and everybody else, to just go. So let's fast forward. 25 years later, God changes his name from Abram to Abraham. Now, why? Because over that 25-year journey, Abraham begins to learn to trust his true friend. It wasn't that he didn't believe God. It was just, yeah, uh, uh, okay, I'll get there eventually. You know, trust, friendship, it, it's... It, it takes maturation. It, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not something that's instantaneous where you go, wow, you're my friend, I can trust you. So here we are 25 years later and Abram is now at a totally different place in his life. I'm going to give you two examples. It wasn't that way at first is what I'm saying. In Genesis chapter 12, there's a famine. And um, Abram decides that he's going to go where there isn't a famine. And he packs up his family and off to Egypt he goes. He never asked the Lord whether or not he should pack up his family. He just does it. Why? Because it seemed like the right thing to do. How many times do we do that? Right? How many times do we say, oh, it just seems like the right thing to do. We never ask God. We just do it. So a little later, he, uh, there's another instance, and, and uh, he, he goes to a place called Philistia. It's where the Philistines live. 
And he's taking his wife, who is just an absolutely knock-dead gorgeous woman. And he's scared to death that they're going to kill him because it's the land of the heathens. They don't know God. They're going to kill me and take my wife. So he says to his wife, Sarah, listen. I know we're going to this place and they're heathens. They have no fear of God and they're going to kill me when they see you. Um, so why don't you tell everybody you're my sister? I'm going to tell everybody that you're my sister and I want you to say that, you're, that I'm your brother. Now, in a sense, it was true because they had the same dad but not the same mother. Uh, she was his like half-sister. It was like West Virginia before today. <laughs> Something like that. Maybe it's New Jersey, I don't know, whatever the case, you know what I'm saying. So, um, he, um, he lies. Oh, what a mess came out of that lie. The, the, the king winds up taking Sarah to be his wife. After all, it's your sister. The king takes Sarah into his harem, and all of a sudden, all the men in the king's harem are breaking out with boils all over the place, and they don't know why. And God comes down to the king and he says to him, Abimelech, what, what, what's, what's happening here? Um, you took somebody's wife. And he says, I didn't know that. Um, God's speaking to a heathen now. I, I, I didn't know she was anybody's wife. He never told me. And God said, yeah, that's why I didn't kill you. Otherwise, I would have killed you right on the spot. Because Abraham's mine. And so Abraham has to get rebuked. Think about this. By a heathen before he... Quits lying. Now, I wonder what would have happened if he had just asked God ahead of time. God, what do I say? I'm going somewhere and they don't think they fear you. I've got this gorgeous wife and I think they're going to kill me because they want her. Um, what should I say? He never asks. He, he, he lies. It seemed like the right thing to do, but it wasn't. And the reality is this. That more times than not, faith is a learning process and it requires maturation. At the age of 100, God changes Abram's name. Isaac is born. Probably, I don't know, most people think Isaac was somewhere between the age of 11 or 12. When God speaks to Abram and he says to Abram, Hey, listen, I want you to take your son and go to the mountain, Mount Moriah. And I want you to sacrifice your son to me. And do you know what the Bible says? The very next morning, he took his boy and went to the mountain. Now look at that. First time God asked him to do something, takes him 15 years. 25 years before he changes his name. Now, the very next day, within less than a night, Abram is listening and obeying God. Why? Because friendship is a bedfellow. And if you say, I don't know what that means, turn with me to Ruth, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And here's what it means. Ruth, we're going to read it. No, the Ruth passage, Danny. There we go. Wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, that's where I'm going to die. And there I will be buried too. And may the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. That's a bedfellow. Wherever you go, I'm going. Wherever you're going to lie down and sleep, that's where I'm lying down and sleeping. That's going to be my place of residence. Where you die, bury me next to you. And God forbid if I should not be that kind of a friend to you. May he punish me ever so severely. That's a bedfellow. That's true friendship. That's what God is to us and to our very last breath. And it's what he wants us to be to him. It's what Abram was to his nephew, Lot. So let's look at it. And here it is. 
Nine heathen kings decide to go to war. I call it the, um, the Shinar Allies and, and the Dead Sea Confederation. <laughs> They're lined up. Now, you say, why would God ever include in his word this crazy story of a war between nine heathen kings? Maybe it's because God is a friend to Abraham and God is a friend to Lot who happens to be taken when these kings go to war. See, Lot, although living in Sodom, still belonged to God. And what a lesson there is to that, to you and me. No matter where you may wander, no matter where I may wander, if you're blood washed and you are blood bought, you still belong to God. And the church said, Amen. you ought to give God a round of applause. Now, does that mean that we may not pay the consequence for our disobedience? No, but what it does mean is God will stick with you to your last breath. And we all said hallelujah. hallelujah. So here's Abram, Lot's uncle, a true friend. And I want you to look at the account. So let's stand as we look at it. So the four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all of their food. Then they went away. And they also carried who? All right, in case you can't read that, it's Abram's nephew, Lot. Let's try that again. All right? <laughs> so, and all their food. Then they went away and they also carried off and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. Continuing. Now a man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, uh, a brother of Eshcol and Anar, all of whom were allied with Abram. So Abram had some allies too. Now when Abram heard that his nephew had been taken captive, this is really cool. Come on, finish it. What a, that, that's an awesome Father's Day message right there. Abram had 318 trained men that were ready to go to war at any instance. In season or out, ready to go to war. His nephew's taken captive. He says, okay, guys, let's go. You've been trained. Let's go to war. And what happens? He recovers all the goods and brought back his nephew Lot and his possessions together with the women and the people continuing to read. Now this is an oddball. We have this battle. Abraham, Abram at the time, rescues his nephew Lot, gives everything that was stolen, and all of a sudden it says, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought bread and wine. Abram doesn't bring the bread and the wine. Melchizedek brings the bread and the wine. Who in the world is Melchizedek? Why does he show up on the scene? The Bible tells us that Melchizedek had no lineage. Now the only person that I know of that has no lineage is who? No, Jesus does have a lineage. He has a human lineage, right? Takes you to Joseph. God has no lineage, no beginning, no end. Jesus doesn't either, but as a human being, he has a lineage. It's traced from, traced from Adam, and then if you trace it from, human be, from the faith, it's Abraham. So this king shows up, and he brings bread and wine, and he was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram. He blesses Abram. What does this moment in time picture? There's bread and wine, right? Come on, is there not bread and wine? What is that a picture of? Do, do, do I have to paint it for you? What's this? Yes, what's this? It's communion. 
It's the first communion. God sitting down with his friend, breaking bread, drinking from the cup, sitting at table. What are they doing? They're celebrating a victory. What is the victory? Lot has been rescued. Abraham has rescued everything that was stolen by the enemy, the heathen. That's what this symbolizes. Have you ever seen it before? I'd never seen it before. That that moment in time, when Melchizedek breaks bread with Abraham, they are celebrating the fact that a person unworthy to be rescued, Lot, living in a sinful community, Lot, God loves, and what he doesn't deserve, God gives to him. Just like God gives to you, Bob, and to me, Kelly, and to you, Allison, what's he do? He gives us what we, doesn't, what we don't deserve. And I want you to think today, as we break bread and we drink from the cup, that God is rescuing us from all of the filth of Sodom and Gomorrah, all the sin, past, present, and future, and we're celebrating a victory. We're dancing before God because he is a true, Friend and the church said. So we're going to enter into communion. You can give the Lord a round of applause as that just come. There has been that moment in time when we have admitted the truth about ourselves that our sin separates us from God. When we quit trying to be God, to be the big one with the capital O. And we realize that without him, we are nothing. And without him, we remain in our sin, our stain, and our shame. But with him, in a glorious moment, we become a child of God, a saint. Every sin, past, present, and future, is nailed to a cross in Christ. Have you received Christ? If not, as you hold this cup, which is symbolic of Jesus taking your place, taking upon himself your sin, stain and shame, just say these words in your heart. They don't have to be fancy. They don't have to be eloquent. Just say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me. Jesus, I give you my life. Here is my heart. I surrender to you. And while you're holding the cup, those of you who prayed with me at the close of the service, just find a little bit of courage to come see me. Let me give you a Bible. Let it be your spiritual birth certificate right in there that today is the day you said, Lord, here I am. Church said, Amen. Amen. After they took of the bread, Jesus raised the cup and said, This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. This for our past, present, and future sins. Let us take in remembrance and celebrate all that he has done in the forgiveness of our sins. Take and drink. Again, let us pray. As we drink from this cup that represents your blood, thank you that it covers all multitude of our sins. We are free from this burden once and for all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to take a moment and celebrate that God has rescued us. But the service isn't quite over. It's about three minutes left. And it has everything to do with what happened after Abram and Melchizedek broke bread and drank wine. So just stay in suspense. We're going to sing just a little bit, and I'm going to take you there. Okay, Bobby. Mm -hmm. 
I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure. I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. Oh. So you know how it is, you read scripture and, and, and you've read it a hundred times and you just don't quite see it until you read it the last time and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, why didn't I ever see that before? I want you to see what happens after they broke bread and drank from the cup. Listen to what is said. Blessed be, this is Melchizedek, this is God now speaking. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth and praise be to God most high who delivered you Abram from your enemies and put them in your hands and what follows read it with me then Abram when they were done communion which was symbolic of the fact that God had rescued Lot Abram then gives God the tithe. Now, you know, we think of the tithe as, well, it's something that God asks us. If it's Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23, this is what you ought to do. We look at it as a way of prioritizing our finances, prioritizing our own life, that as we give to God, he blesses us, all those things. I never saw it in this light, that it's us offering God gratitude for salvation. The fact that God has rescued us. God, we give back to you this tithe as an act of celebration and gratitude for something I could have never done on my own. So let me just, in some way, give you a little blessing. So today, as we give our tithes and offerings, could you think of it a little different? Like, think of it more than just, well, I know it keeps the church running and it pays the pastor's salary and... Can you think of it as, this is my gift to God for God saving me? It's not much, I can't pay him back, but it's some act of gratitude. And the church said, amen. amen. So ushers, if you'd come forward, we're going to offer God an act of gratitude. Come on, Brother Abe, you can step it up. So you won't be offended if I tell this little story on you, can I, Abe? All right. So Abe's 95, and he's ushering, by the way. So Abe used to say to my wife, this is what he'd say to my wife. He'd say, I wonder why those old people walk like this. And he says, one day I said, why do I walk like that? <laughs> Maybe it's because he's 95. I hope I'm walking like Abe when I'm 95, right? So, Lord, we pray you bless this offering. May it be our act of gratitude that you have rescued us when we were unable to rescue ourselves. And the church said, Amen. Amen.